Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 101 of Percussion Discussion. Um, as usual, I'm going to ask you to please check out our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our world-famous YouTube channel. Please subscribe. It only takes a second, and it means you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. Um, if you'd rather listen on the go, then this is no problem. All of our conversations are available in podcast form, and these are free to download from your favorite podcast provider. So if that's your thing, you know what to do. Leave us a review as well if you can find a few seconds. On to today's guest, uh, an incredible British drummer. Uh, for the last 25 years, he's been the, um, the drummer powering the Stiff Little Fingers. He's also played for Jake Burns and The Big Wheel. He's played for The Alarm, uh, Julian Lennon. Glenn Matlock, Billy Duffy, the list goes on and on and on. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the fabulous Steve Grantley. Steve, thanks so much for doing this, mate. I, re I really appreciate it. You're welcome, man. Glad oh, to be here. It's great yeah. to see you. And before we go any further, uh, as always, uh, I have to thank our pal uh, Adam Parsons for, for connecting us up. Yeah, he's a good lad. So he manages uh, Stiff Little Fingers among, amongst many other bands. And, you know, he's a great drummer himself. Yes. He plays oh. drums and, and he's very much part of the drum community. So, yeah, thanks for having me, mate. I really appreciate you inviting oh, me along. I, I, I really appreciate it. I really do. So you're you're the, uh, we've got to the 100th landmark with Billy Cobham. So you're the, the next one after Billy Cobham. 101. I'm there in room 101. Room 101. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep you, though. We're not going to get yeah. rid of you. So, oh, yeah, I would. I'd, 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 get, I'd get rid of me, yeah. That's all right. You can swear it's fine. We don't mind in here. We're okay. Right. We're broad-minded. Um, how's it going, mate? All right. Yeah, good, man. I've been really busy. <clears throat> Stiff little fingers were extremely busy through the whole of the year, and yeah. especially through the summer. We had some big festivals come up, which we've been waiting two years because of lockdown. Sure. And so we to to connect those big festivals, we put little shows in between. So we called it in uh, in your backyard, SLF in your backyard. Yeah. Uh, because we were actually going to places that we wouldn't normally go to, but to fill in the gaps and take the music to the people, as it were, we, we did these smaller shows. So we've been very busy through the summer. And I just finished about two weeks ago uh, and we're not doing anything now until March next year when we do our annual, you know, yeah, British it's the, tour. It's a traditional thing for you guys. It's a traditional it? fingers yeah. tour. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It'll be my, it'll be my 26th year at the Barrowland on the trot. That's uh, amazing. On St. Pat's nights. We play St. Patrick's night and, you know, when it got to about 15 years of playing the same venue on the same night, you know, on St. Pat's night, I thought, Christ, it's, it's 15 years already, and now it's 25, and next year will be 26. I don't know where the time's gone. I really don't. So it's how amazing. does that work? Is is it literally you you do it and then you go same again next year then, and they put it in there, they book it out to you? Is that the way it works? Yeah, or straight away. I mean, we'd have to if we weren't going to do that gig, we'd have to announce we weren't playing. Yeah, because people just assume, and it's kind of a pilgrimage. People come from all over the world to come to the Barrows gig. So it, it, it's a very special night. It's like with the band, it's like, you know, seven gigs till the Barrows. Yeah, yeah. You know, four gigs, three gigs. It is kind of a countdown. And it's a fair, you know, when you walk into that, when you walk into that venue, there's a feeling in the, in the walls, you know, and it means a lot to the band and everybody's a little bit more on edge. And it's a really special night. And it's because Glasgow's just an amazing audience, incredible. Yeah. You know, crazy. And that was my first gig with the band ever. My first ever gig with Stick Little Fingers was wow. at the Barrowland. What an introduction that was. Oh, mate. Because they said to me, do you want to have a warm-up gig? Jake said to me, do you want to have a warm-up gig? And I'd played in a band called Horse, and we uh, we did um, the uh, Secret Affair tour with Tina Turner. So I'd played arenas, and I'd done, you know, the Ahoy in Rotterdam, and, you know, and so I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'll be all right. But I stood at the side of the stage that night at the Barrows, and I was really really scared and the other thing was was that while we were rehearsing for my first ever slf tour we were also rehearsing songs for a brand new album oh, right, right, which okay. called, uh, yeah which was called tinder which came out which was called tinderbox yes, so by the time we'd rehearsed the live set the rest of the guys were so bored of playing the live set jake went to me oh you know suspect device and stuff uh, and uh, alternative also you'll be all right so when i went on stage and played at the barons that was the very first time I'd played either of those songs with the band ever. Which, let's be honest, you know, it's the, arguably the biggest songs the band have ever you, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the, known the, for. Yeah, they're the big songs. And I was like, and he went, no, 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 you you know them. They're easy. You'll be all right. But it was like, and I think that there was a couple of tricky ones. So what Soundcheck, you know, I played the ones that I just wanted to get, you know, a little bit more familiar with. But as I say, Suspect Device and Alternative Vols are probably their two 
most iconic songs. I didn't play with the band until I was live in front of the Bowerland audience, which I, <laughs> oh, mate, it was it's pretty scary, you know. But the feeling of elation, <laughs> oh yeah, the feeling of elation after the, the show when you come off and you've done it. I mean, it was just us just on a high for days, you know. Wow, amazing. I mean, and, and let's talk about the um the show you did, like the hometown show in Belfast on the twentieth. It was uh, was it um custom. Custom, custom House, it's Custom House Square custom House. in the centre of Belfast. That looked an amazing show. T tell us about that one. Well, yeah, so we had, um, so the Undertones were with us, um, Selector and uh, Ricky Warwick and the Fighting Hearts. Yeah. Um, and that's our show. We put that on yeah. and it was sold out. It was oversubscribed, actually. I think there was about 150 people extra in, you know, so stretching their necks at the back. Sure. And it's just incredible because it's, it's open air. Um, and it's it's kind of purposely built it's in the centre of Belfast, and it's just stiff little fingers take over Belfast, and it is very very special for all of us, but especially for Jake and, and Ali because they're Belfast boys. Of course. And back in the day, everybody was saying to them, "You'll never get anywhere. You're shy, you know." And then they go back as conquering heroes. But everywhere you go, there's SLS shirts in the bars, walking around in the restaurants. It is it's, it becomes stiff little fingers world for that day. And I must admit that the Barons is, is a very special night, but now so is Belfast, because yeah. Jake introduced Alternative Ulster as the new national anthem and then started the, you know, the iconic chords, yeah. quiet start, and it just sent shivers down my spine. God knows what it must have been like for everybody else. Just uh, And so that's become another night that people make a pil pilgrimage to from America and Canada and Japan and stuff and all come over to, to see that show. And I think that's going to be a regular thing. The last weekend in August is going to be Stiff Little Fingers put the, the fast in Belfast. Wow. I think that's going to be a, a, a regular show now. Do you know what? But, but a I mean, it's almost... Um... It's almost a festival in itself with the other bands that you mentioned, isn't it? You know, yeah, it starts around five o'clock, yeah. you know. And it, um, uh, Terry Hooley is the DJ, um, and the tickets were like £27.50, you know, for four bands. You know, at one point we had the, we had the Stranglers, the Ruts, um, uh, I think it was the Defects, all on the same bill. Then the next year we had the Buzzcocks and, uh, and the Damned. You know, all on the same bill for twenty seven pound and fifty. I mean, it's a it is a it's a very special night, as I keep saying. But what happened was it stayed with us for days afterwards. Like a couple of days later, we played some more shows on the mainland, and I said to Jake, "You know, I'm still on a high from Belfast. Can't get it out of my mind. It was so good because the thing was that we all came off feeling that we played well. It's like a couple of times we've had technical problems, which puts people, you know, on you know shaky ground, or someone feels that they didn't do particularly well. But on on this show, on this this show at, the, at Belfast, we all felt that we'd done well. We all felt felt that we played to the best of our ability. And every, like I say, everybody was on a high, but it just stuck with us for days after. It was a uh, yeah. Amazing. And you think you think twenty seven fifty for a ticket? You can't buy a t shirt at a lot of shows for that. That's amazing. No, I know. I, I know. We do, we do try to keep the ticket prices, uh, mm. you know, lower because uh, Stiff Little Fingers always have been sort of a working class band. And, you know, because some places, you know, they're charging 70, 80, 90 pound a ticket, you know. And I just don't think I, I wouldn't pay that to see someone, you know. But hey, look, I, I, amazing that things are going so well. Uh, obviously, we'll talk about the other band as we go. But for now, okay. can we can we kind of go back to where it all started for you, Steve? I mean, what's your, I, I think I ask everybody this, can, what's your first memory of music rather than drums itself? What's your first memory of music? Um, I think, well, I was, I was born in Fulham in London and I think it was uh, just be becoming aware of my dad's Tommy Dorsey, big band jazz records sure. uh, and Frank Sinatra, um, you know, Strangers in the Night, that's something that I that sort of a, a, is a, in the back of my mind, like a ghostly tune in the back of my mind all the time. And then um, and then sort of more crooners like Tony Bennett and mm -hmm. Andy Williams, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's was my initial in, uh, introduction to music was that. But my dad wanted to be a drummer, but he never did become a drummer, but he wanted to be a drummer. And uh, he used to he loved this band called the, uh, the Ted Heath Big Band. Yes, yeah. And uh, and they were very much like in, in the style of Tommy Dorsey, big band swing jazz, right? Um, and um, and the drummer that he used to go and see is a guy called Ronnie Verrill. And so the first drummer's name that I ever knew was Ronnie. 
Animal. Um, <laughs> yeah, who was Animal of the Muppets. Yeah. But it, but so much more. I mean, he worked with Shirley Bassey and Tom Jones and everybody, everybody. And he was on so many sessions and all that stuff. Yeah. You've got Clem Tini, but you've also got Ronnie Verrill. Yeah. And so I ended up, he was the first drummer's name. That was the first drummer's name I knew. That, Kenny Clare, and then probably Buddy Rich. But I got I went to a couple of um, I went to a couple of jazz gigs once and met Ronnie mm -hmm. and sort of chatted to him and he sort of became a little bit of a mentor and stuff. And I also got a job with and one of my first professional jobs with it was with the Thames Television Big Band. Oh wow! And I used to I was the rehearsal drummer. We used to do go out and do live shows and I was the drummer. But when they did big TV things, Ronnie would be the drummer. So I was kind of at like 18, 19, sort of depping for Ronnie Verrill, which is mind-blowing, mind, oh, yeah. absolutely mind-blowing. But it was at Teddington Lock in Teddington, um, and that was uh, Thames Television, big band. Yeah, and we used to, like I say, we used to go out and do, like, um, dance band things, and people would be dancing, and, and it would there'd be sort of, you know, people would be having dinner and stuff. But it was, um, it was a very professional situation so i had to sharpen up real quick and i was about 18 19 were, were you reading then because i'd imagine there'd been parts for, for the for everybody yeah well i got the job through my drum teacher um uh and he uh, we hadn't really i wasn't that good of a of a reader mm -hmm. so i got this job through my drum teacher and i turned up and it was all gobbledygook to me really but i recognized the titles and a lot of the arrangements were Tommy Dorsey arrangements. So I knew these arrangements by ear. And there was also things like we did, um, we closed the first set with the theme from Hawaii Five O, which obviously I knew. So there was a lot of stuff. So I just played along. You know, I just played. I, I just played. So my drum teacher, David Hodge, he said, you know, if you don't know what to play, play something. Yeah. Listen to what the band is doing and just jam along. Don't just sit there and go, oh, I don't know what to do. Don't do that. Play something. So that was really good advice because there was a couple of songs. I don't know what I'm doing. But, oh, it says Bossa Nova. Well, I know how to play Bossa Nova. So just feel the music, play the Bossa Nova, put a couple of fills in, finish. They think I'm reading. I'm not. I'm just <laughs> listening and jamming, you know. So that what happened was on the first the first night that I did, where I decked for my drum teacher, they signed me up on the spot and said, right, you know, you'll get a pass to Teddington Lock and we'd like you to do more shows and could you do a, I think it was Monday nights used to go down and do this rehearsal thing mm -hmm. um yeah it was, it was a good introduction to professional work because you know that these guys were twice my age so they weren't going to have some little shit drummer in there you know messing about you you get there your gear works you're smart you're on time yeah. don't mess about this is serious business. So I think what it did was it instilled in me a professional attitude at a very young age, rather than just in, you know, punk clubs and stuff where you just do what you want and everybody turns up late and the gear don't work and that stuff. I was on it. Yeah, I had to be. You've got to be. I mean, it's you know, especially with so many in a band like you would in a big band. I mean, you could have 17 or 18 guys up there. Um, yeah. But, you know, reading or not reading, you still need to have your big band chops together to get all the hits and fills and, and everything. Yeah. In, you? It's not it's not yeah. easy, not easy stuff. It must be quite daunting. Um, but like you say, if you know the arrangements, then it's half the battle, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I was thinking, I mean, I think it was because I was young and naive and had no fear and didn't quite realise what I was walking into. And sometimes that can be a good thing yeah. that when, when, when you're naive, your naivety can get you through. And probably if I was put in that position now, I'd be like, I can't read that shit. You know, I can't do it. But it was just like, I, I got on with it and got through, you know. And then I went back to my drum teacher and said, listen, like, uh, you know, we played Take Five. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I didn't, I, and we'd never done Five Four. I didn't know that. So I just listened to the boom, da, boom, da, boom, 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 da, boom, da, and I just played that right the way through, you know, and just played safe and just, listen to what was going on but um did you do the solo yeah. I, I didn't do the solo they kind of broke and i just sort of carried on and just did the and just did the and stuck to that kept that going on in my kept that going on in my mind and then i think everybody cottoned on and then we we went yeah. back but that, that was sort of while people were eating and yeah you know milling about and stuff because yeah. there was a section of the evening where everybody got up and danced and it was waltzes and all that stuff and that was a piece of piss you know well, well, well apparently uh when joe morello did the solo in take five. Uh, I think it quite famously he was asked, do you count it? And he, and he, like you just said, he just sings the melody in his head while he's playing the solo, which is easier, easier said than done. But 
you know, the results are stunning, aren't they? But I, I wouldn't go anywhere near it personally. Not that so. <laughs> no, I, I, no, and I'm the, and I'm not really good with the odd time signatures. You know, really, you know, I'm really not good. When I have any colleague you to do stuff, I'm like, how does he know where he is? Where is that? You know, it's that. You know that. You know, turn it on again by Genesis. Yes. You know that bit before the chorus, boom, boom. I still can't get that. I'm counting it out. I'm list. I've known that. I've been listening to that song since it came out in about 1980, 81, and I still can't suss out that bit. I'm not good with odd time signatures. I do, you know. I, sometimes I can get it, but like with the take five thing, I was just going boom, 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 just to keep the feel of that riff going in my head till everybody come back in. I'll tell you what, like, like you said, your teacher said, play, just play something, you know. The, yeah. the, the ultimate giveaway that you don't know what you're doing is if you just stop and go. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's the best advice. I give the same advice to my students. You know, you've got to, you've got to do something. Don't just sit there, you know. Yeah. You'll so if the, band, if the band leader or the singer counts off the tune and, you go, and your mind goes blank and you're like, I don't remember how this one starts yeah. you know now that could be because you're tired or you're hungover you're jet lagged or you're overly nervous mm -hmm. and nerves get to you and your brain just freezes and you the, the singer goes one two three four you just and then you go oh yeah i remember it's that one when i start on the floor or whatever it is but yeah. don't go huh? you can't do that you've got to like we say you've got to play something it's a good piece of advice yeah just give your brain play something Give your brain a couple of bars to catch up. Just give you, you're buying yourself a bit of time, aren't you, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's solid. So so how long were you doing the big band thing for then, Steve? I did that for about a year. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then I was doing, and during that time, David Hodge, my teacher, was, was sort of throwing little gigs that he didn't want. He was throwing them my way. So I'd do like little uh, jazz trios in East End pubs. That's back in the day when they used to have little bands in pubs, you know. Um, and, but I was also in my own band called the Gate Crushers, which was me and some, you know, mates from the local town. And we wanted to be rock stars, you know, we wanted to be, we wanted to be famous rock stars. And so I sort of felt, uh, what, which, what path am I going to take? Am I going to go down this? Because I could have been, that they were, this was professional work that I was getting paid for. Like on a, on a, I did a Friday and a Saturday night in this pub and I got paid 30 quid. Yeah, I had a day job as an apprentice spraying cars and I got 19 pounds a week and I was, and I was, and I was working from eight till five. Wow. So something in my brain went, hold on a minute, 30 quid for playing the drums, 19 for spraying cars. But the only thing was, was that I decided I don't want to be that session guy playing jazz and trios. I want to be, a, I want to be a rock and roller. I am a rock and roller. I want to be in a rock band. So I stopped doing that and focused on my band and kept the day job as much as I didn't like the day job. I felt that it was, and it wasn't really a plan. It was just felt it was more instinctual than anything else. I don't think I want to do that. I do want to do that. I'd, I'd rather be, you know, a, 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 in a rock band. That's what I'm going to pursue. So I kept the day job on, but I used to teach as well yeah. to try and make some money as well. Sure. Sure. So obviously, you know, you've gone from one band to another. What happens after that band? Did it go far? No, well, I mean, we, the band called The Gate Crash has never really got anywhere. Yeah. And we tried everything and we played endless gigs and we sent in hundreds of demo tapes and we got, you know, hundreds of rejection letters. And in the end, I just got thoroughly sick of not being successful. You know, uh, I'm not even, you know, it, 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 we tried and we failed. Mm. And so I started answering um, adverts in the back of Melody Maker, sure. which at the time, Melody Maker mag uh, magazine, a big newspaper, came out every yeah. Thursday, and I'd get that. So I auditioned for various bands, and then I saw this audition, um, didn't get any of the auditions, didn't, but I think it's the, the, the second or third audition that I went for, the advert said, internationally successful rock band, seeks drummer must play reggae, right? And this is about 81, 82, right? And I was like, well, who could that be? And it was a big advert, you know. Who can that be? The only band, the only rock band I know that, that are internationally successful and they play reggae and they're a rock band is The Clash. It can't mm. be The Clash. You know, I've got Topper. Yeah. So anyway, I made a phone call. They took my details. Then they gave me an address to go down to in Camden to go and play it in Camden. So come down to this thing. So I went to this studio in Camden the next day, walked in, and um, 
He took two guys behind the desk and they said, OK, you just go in behind the drums, get yourself settled. And I said, can I ask who this is for? And they went, no, we can't tell you. <laughs> so I said, OK, then. So sat down, got the kit sorted out, put the headphones on. They said, OK, play along to this. First track, Magnificent Seven by The Clash. So the click starts. Right? So I'm, I'm sitting there, still don't know what it is. Click, tick, 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 tick. Two, three, four. Dugga, 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 dum. Dum, dum. We know drop the phone. And I'm like, I'm auditioning for the clash here. So I played the Magnificent Seven, which I've been playing along to anyway. Loved Topper's playing, knew the track back to front. So nailed that. They went in the control room. That's great. Playing along to this one, complete control. Right? So they said, just like you're on stage, go crazy. So that was it. Played those two songs. I said, come in. So I went in and filled out form. I went, it's a clash, isn't it? And they went, can't tell you. And I went, oh, it's a fucking clash, isn't it? So I got asked a load of questions. And it was lots of uh, do you take drugs, all this stuff, because I think they were they were having problems at that time with Paul Topper and his uh, his heroin addiction. So anyway, they said, listen, that was really good. Come down to Olaf Street Studios in Hammersmith tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So I go down to Olaf Street Studios and walk through the door, and there's Paul Simon and, and Joe Strummer. I'm Steve, in the press. How old were you at this point, mate? 21. Oh my God! Right, and I was, and I was, and although I'd done all of the, although I've done all the big band stuff, I was still a bit green. Yeah. Okay, I was still a bit green. I'd never been abroad. I'd never, you know, I, I was still a bit green. So I walked in and I was like, Jesus Christ, it's the Clash, you know. So they came over and it was, you know, quite nice. Sat down behind the kit and they said, Okay, then let's do Tommy Gun. Well, you know, Tommy Gun is this is a is a difficult drum track. It's great drum track. Yeah. I knew it. I'd been practicing all that stuff, you know, so I knew, I knew that. So I sat down. When I finished at the end, it goes, digga, 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 bow, bow. Yeah, the last two notes. I stood up. Matty, I stood up. But like, and they looked at me, it's like, it's a bit confident for someone. on. <laughs> but it was just exuberant. So it might have been nerves, I don't know. But, and then we did, you know, rock the cas bar and all that stuff. And then we went down the pub and, um, and uh, Joe Stomach said to me, listen, that was really, really good. I really, that was great, man. He said, listen, the next gig that we're going to do is going to be in New York because it's a, a three-day festival. First night is being headlined by Bowie. Second night is going to be at Van Halen and then us. Whoa. And he said, so, and he said, so have you got a passport? I was like, no, I've never been abroad. I ain't got a passport. So he said, go down to Petty France. Petty France, get yourself an emergency passport. If you sit there all day, you can get a passport on the day. So I said, okay, then. And he said, listen, here's the songs I want you to learn. As far as I'm concerned, you carry on like this. You're my guy. So what happened was it went down. So what they had was they had something like 700 people call up and make a phone call. About 200 went down and played to tapes. 10 went down and played with Joe and Paul. Uh, Mick Jones was in America at the time. Ten guys went, and then it was it was down to two, me and Pete Howard, the guy who eventually got it. Okay. But for two weeks, I rehearsed with them in the morning, and he rehearsed with them in the afternoon. Then came the big audition. Mick Jones is flying back from New York. I never knew anyone who'd been to New York. I'm a kid from Fulham. I don't know anything about anything, anything like that. You know, that's how green I was. Um, Mickey Gallagher from the uh, Blockheads, Ian during the Blockheads, he's on keyboards, right? Oh, Bernie Rhodes, the manager is there. Mick Jones walks in. It was a bit weird because Mick said to me, so what star sign are you? And I was like, what? Fucking star sign? He was like, I said, yeah, Pisces. He went, oh, he goes, very artistic, but very sensitive. And I was like, yeah, if you say so, mate. It was a bit weird. And then he said, right, straight away, he said, right, so let's do London Calling. Ready? One, two, three, four. Bah, bah, bah. And I wasn't there. I, I, I sort of, it was just, it was all a bit... And he went, I usually have a drummer with me when I start this one. Oh, oh. oh mate, Matty, can you imagine? Oh. My, my confidence level went like that. And then uh, we, uh, we, uh, there's a little drum solo in the middle of Rock the Casbah. I remember it goes, uh, the king's by the bird. There's a little sort of fills in. Yep. Drop the fucking stick uh, in the middle of that. And then and, and I dropped the stick. And then at the end of the song, Joe Strummer came over and he picked the stick up and he went between sort of like the cymbal stands and that. He went, you okay, man? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. But I, I knew I was fucking up. And, and and I got more and more nervous and more and more nervous. So anyway, I did my audition and then Pete Howard, he came in after me. So the next day I get a phone call from Baker. And if you know anything about the Clash, Baker was like their right hand man. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, hello, Steve, it's Baker. And I went, and the first thing was, it's about 11 o'clock on the Thursday morning. I was just on a Wednesday, it's a Thursday morning. And, and, uh, and I said, I ain't got it, have I? 
I knew straight away, so I haven't got it, have I? And he went, no, I'm sorry, mate, you ain't. He said, we were all rooting for you. We wanted the kid from the street to have it, because that's kind of what I was. Yeah. The other guy, Pete Howard, had the haircut. He had the brothel creepers, the skin-tight jeans, the leather jacket. He looked like he was already in the clash, don't yeah, yeah. And I was just a kid in a blue T-shirt, you know. Um, and, and he said, but listen, Steve, um, somebody wants to have a world beer. And um, Joe Strummer comes on the phone. And he goes, man, what happened? And I said, Joe, I don't, I don't know, mate. I don't know. I just lost it. And he goes, it's such a shame, man. He said, I really had my hopes pinned on you. He said, but never mind. He said, listen, I'll tell you this. He said, you're a world-class drummer and you will, you will do well. Just now it's not your time, man. It's just not your time. I said, Joe, thank you so much for that. And he said, listen, I'll hand you back to Baker and all the best with the future, mate. And I said, thank you. So then I chat to Baker and put the phone down. Burst into tears. I was very upset. But I just lost the clash. You know what I mean? The clash, one of the one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, but that was a good, that was a good. So that was like what you were saying about that was me stepping out of yeah. being in my local bands. And that was like a, a baptism of fire. Next one I did was an internationally successful guitar player, Seeps Drummer. And it was Jake Burns from Stiff Little Fingers. Jake had just broken Stiff Little Fingers up. And I went in, and I'm not being funny after you've been in the presence of the clash and you've done all that and you've been playing with them for two weeks. I was a lot more, I was a lot more confident and I was a lot less green yeah. than I was when it, so I walked into that, at that audition with a lot more confidence and nailed it and got the job. That's how I met Jake Burns with Stiff Little Fingers because he had his own band, Jake Burns and the Big Wheel, that I was the original drummer in. And, and you know, did, did, right, this sounds a silly thing to say, but did you kind of dodge a bullet in some way because the clash, weren't around for much longer after that, were they? You know, they, 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 there was a poor, a substandard album came out and... It was awful. Cut the Crap was a dreadful album. I don't even see it as a Clash album, to tell you the truth. You know, and, and then that was it. So, <laughs> I don't know. Did you dodge a bullet? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because Pete Howard, they treated him very poorly. Mm. Um, Bernie Rhodes was, you know, was always the manager, but Bernie really had full control by that point. From what I, from what I've read and from what I've been told, I don't know absolutely, but I, I've heard from a lot of sources that he was really calling the shots by that point, and the guys weren't getting paid as much money as they were told they were going to get paid, and they were treated very, very poorly. And eventually, it came to nothing, and they split up. And Pete Howard has done nothing since, as far as I know. It, kind, I saw a documentary, and he seemed like a broken man when it came to music. Whereas what happened to me was it inspired me to do more, to do better, to be better, and to sort of live up to what Joe Strummer had said. Steve, you are a world-class drummer. And I thought, well, if Joe Strummer's going to tell me that, it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even if it wasn't. I, I had the, I, I felt like I've, I have got the potential to be good. I just need to work harder and get more confidence. And 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 when I went into the Jake Burns, the Big Will uh, 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 thing, I really felt that I was far more ready for that than I was going in for the Clash. And I think that's why I got the gig because I went in full, fully powered up, confident, and could speak up for myself a little bit better. It taught me a lot that uh, failing the clash, and I think it, it it was a good thing because I I I'd much rather be where I am now, where I've been in stiff little things for twenty five years. I've worked with you know Glenn Matlock from the Pistols. I've worked with Billy Duff from the Cult. I've worked with John Deacon from from Queen. That that all that stuff, you know. Whereas poor Pete, he it sort of ruined him. You know, it it, it destroyed his confidence. So I, I'm glad I, I'm glad. In hindsight, I'm glad I didn't get the clash. I think it would have been too early for me. 70,000 people in like some big place in New York when I'm 21, and the biggest place I've ever played is like to 250 people. It would have freaked me out, I think. <laughs> oh, you know what? You've, uh, you've, you've had, uh, you know, so far an incredible career, haven't you? And you've stuck at it. And, and as you say, the names you've just mentioned, you know, uh, Billy Duffy, Glenn Matlock, you know, yeah. household names. Um, uh, you know, uh, just amazing, absolutely incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, when I worked with John Deacon, we did a session together. I'm like, it's fucking John Deacon from Queen. You know, I was a fan when I was a kid, you know, when I was a small kid. And, uh, you know, very laid back guy, you know, but what, but just to be in the studio with someone like that and think, I'm playing with them, that's just, yeah. But Billy, uh, Bill, but Billy's great, he was one of my favourite guitar players. Being on a stage with Billy, um, 
haven't done much recording with Billy, but did a lot of live work. So we had a band together called Color Sound, which was Mike Peters, uh, Craig Adams from the Mission, Billy from the Colt, and I me from Stiff Little Fingers. I remember it. I remember this band. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because uh, wow. obviously you you were in the alarm for how long did you do in the alarm, Steve? I, can't uh, I did. I did the whole of the, the naughty. So we worked together in ninety eight, ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, but that was Mike's um, electric band yes and then in, in 2000 he got the alarm 2000 he sort of relaunched the alarm and i worked right the way through till 2010 yeah. so it was a good 10 to 12 years that we worked together so at one point i was you know i was touring and recording with stiff little fingers and touring and recording with the alarm at the same time so it was a really busy schedule but again it was a great learning process because yeah. you just get so used to being in them you know you get so used to being in the recording studio get so used to being on a stage playing live it just you know you just become battle hardened logistically that must have been tricky trying to sort your diary out i bet you were like this playing oh, the dates no. didn't cross over and and they and they and they did i mean it was the undoing of me in the end and and i suppose you, you, your, your loyalty has to go to the band that you've been in the longest i i guess yeah i mean the thing is is that um uh, when I put stiff little fingers were managed by the same guy who managed Mike Peters, and yeah. when Mike needed a drummer, our manager said, Well, why don't you use Steve Gartley from Stiff Little Fingers? And Mike, being a big Stiff Little Fingers fan, yeah. said, Yeah, great. I met Mike, we got on great, we got on really well. So, but I was there because I was a drummer in Stiff Little Fingers, and Stiff Little Fingers is my main priority. Yeah, yeah. It was then, and it, it was then, and it is now. Um, but uh, and Mike was said, listen, I really want you to be the drummer in my band. I will work around the Stiff Little Fingers schedule so I can have you as a drummer, which I was highly honoured because he had access to Mark Buziki and all kinds of guys. The guy from, I can't remember his name, but the guy from James, he was playing occasionally with the band. Scott Garrett was an American guy. He occasionally sat in. But Mike worked the alarm schedule around Stiff Little Fingers. And I was, uh, as I say, I was very grateful for that. That's a compliment. But dates would clash. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, okay, it's an absolute compliment. But dates would clash because Stiff Little Fingers had a habit of putting things in at the last minute, and then I'd have to call Mike and go, "Mate, I can't do these dates." And I think in the end, Mike just got totally pissed off with that, and I don't blame him. Yeah. Um, and then he said to me, "Look, unless you can give," it was very long and complicated, but unless you can give me priority, I can't really use you as a drummer anymore. That was the bottom line. And I said, well, you, you know what it was going to be. Yeah. And, and you know, I can't do that. So <clears throat> we, we, so we parted the company. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, but that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Spot yeah. and roll. That's the way, that's the way things go. And uh, it freed my time up. And that time that was, was filled up with alarm then became filled up with RTZ because stiff little fingers do work a lot, but it's not all the time. And I'm, I'm sort of like hyper, hyperactive. So uh, I have to be doing something. Well, that's brought us nicely into RTZ. Now, yeah. um, I, I was already aware of the, the 2018 album, um, Punk Funk, which is, I yeah. think, fantastic and shows maybe some uh, influences from your from your youth. I, I'm hearing sort of Clyde Stubblefield in there on loads of that, loads of James Brown kind of things in there. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, uh, yeah, so I'm a big Funkadelic fan, big James Brown fan. I listen to James Brown since I was, you know, 14, 15. Loved yeah. the Fat Back Band. Um, loved Prince as well. Big Prince fan. And that's what I would, a lot of the time, that's what I would practice at home. If I was practicing time where I wanted to get like a feel right, it would be the functions because the drums are at the fore and they often don't change. There's not big feels in the funk stuff. They get the groove and they stick to it. So I could sort of prep and I like practice into funk music so i thought why don't i do this when i record the next album with rtz you know you could never do it with stiff little fingers it would that wouldn't fit but i thought rtz i can take in any direction i want so how about if we do it's not an original idea to mix you know oh. uh, punk rock with funk because you know ian dury and the blockers they were funky you know talking edge you could say were were, were funky oh. um even the clash you know uh, uh this is radio clash is very funky uh, as is uh, Overpowered by Funk or The Magnificent Seven. So it wasn't really an original idea, but it was original for me. So I went in with my sort of funky grooves, big, you know, massive rock guitars and punk rock attitude. So that's how that's how Funk Punk kind of came about. Because uh, I just thought, right, I'm going to do something because I'm always playing along to these tunes. Mm. 
let's do some of that in the studio and keep it groovy and keep it straight ahead, more four on the floor or little tricky little, you know, syncopated snare drum things. It's such, it's such a, I, I love the album. I love the feel of it. And, and I love Thank the, you, mate. I, I really appreciate that, Matty. Thank you. I, I love the that. lyrics as well. <laughs> Some great lyrics in there, I have to say. So, well, tell us about, I mean, RTZ, is it purely a recording project, Steve? Or is, do you ever, do you ever, do you ever gig it? Because I know there's, there's kind of you, there's, well, there's kind of two or three of you involved in it, really, isn't there, I guess? Yeah. Well, it started off, it started off in 98. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, myself and a guy called John Magno, who's a great guitar player and engineer. We worked on various things together. And what had happened was was that I I'd done all the gigs to get Color Sound, the record deal, yeah. and then they were going to record the album. And I got back off the March tour with sure. the Little Fingers, but they recorded the album with someone else ah. because I wasn't available. But they didn't tell me, <laughs> and I found out by accident. Right. Um, and they went, no, no, he's not here. He's in the studio recording an album. I, I, what it was, I'd called Craig Adams to see if he wanted to come and see Stiff Little Fingers when we were playing in Leeds. And his wife said, no, he's in the studio with Scott Garrett recording the cover sound album. I said, what? That was the first I heard of it. Oh. So I was upset by that. Going back to me and John, John Mack was a great friend. He was a good songwriter. I was, I'm writing all the time. And so I was upset about the Colour Sound album. So I got in contact with John and said, fuck it, let's make our own album. Let's do our own. But we won't do demos or anything. We'll make an album. We'll put a CD out. We'll, you know. So that's how RTZ came about. And so we did that. John came up with the name RTZ. That was his, his, his invention. Um, but then I got really busy with the alarm and stiff little fingers. John went to America. <laughs> and, and so RTZ went on the down low for a while. Um, and so, and then I got, a, and John went to America, was uncontactable. He got involved with a cult out in America, with a, like a, a religious cult not, in not America. The cult, was, a cult. Not the cult, a cult, right? <laughs> right. He eventually had to escape America and wow. come back to England. But in that period when he was like, uh, he was like, the, he was in radio silence, me and a guy called Jonesy, we got together. He was a great guitar player. Uh, you know, we wrote some songs together. That became Zed Head. Then we did Funk Punk, and then John came back from America and went, I escaped, I'm back. <laughs> and so then we did Zed Nation, and we also brought a guy called uh, 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 James Aline in on bass. We'd all worked with in the, in the 90s. In fact, I did, produced his band Decoder back in the 90s, and that sort of was really nice. It brought everybody back into the fold. Um, but it is a live project, to sure. answer your question. It is a live project. I mean, John and I did a couple of gigs um, almost like there's a band called Suicide where it's just two of them and they sort of they have like a, an organ and a singer we did a couple of dates like that in fact we did the gathering I think we did kept gathering um, in 2000 and in 2007 or 8 we did as RTZ and then um, we did a we did a set of live shows with Jonesy mm -hmm. um, and a band we had a full band and that became an album um, called Crunch. That was a live album from the Bullingdon. And then we've done various other shows. We just did Westworld with Spear of Destiny. Oh, wow. Okay. And it looks as if we're going to be doing some December dates for Spear of Destiny. We're just waiting for the dates to come through. So oh, it excellent. is very much, it is very much a live thing. We used, to, uh, when we're playing live, um, Danny Farrant from the Buzzcocks is our drummer because I'm up front singing the yeah, cool. songs and playing the guitar because no one else wants to sing the song. So I have to do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it is very much a live thing. Yeah. Amazing, but you know um, the, the new album Z Nation, which I know isn't it's it's released. Well, this is coming out on the twenty second, so it will be. It will, I'll, I'll say it'll have been released yesterday. So as, yeah. as we're recording this, it's not out, but it'll be out yesterday. In yeah, it, yeah, it's that. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's released. It, it was released yesterday um, on the twenty first of October, yeah. and that's available on all download things all platforms you know the dreaded spotify the lot yeah yeah uh do you know and the album is a million miles away from punk funk isn't it it's it's polar opposite as you say you can take it wherever you want and you do take it wherever you want this it's it's if you if you played the two albums next to, or back to back you wouldn't really think it was the same band vocally you might go well i recognize the voice but very little else, I, I think, and I think that's a great thing. You know, it's fresh. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I I really did step out of the of the the parameters of what RTZ was started. What what we what we started to do with 
uh, with RTZ. Um, but there's a lot of electronica on there, and the first album was very uh, 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 electronica. Mm -hmm. um, there are, but there's, it's funky, but there's still some big guitars on there. There's a shed load of like punk rock attitude on there. Mm. from me being a droppy, snotty little git, you know, um, like you say in the lyrics. And so I can see, it, it, but it, is a, it was a massive departure of, of, of what RTZ was supposed to be about. But it was a, not, it was a good left turn to take, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's where I was at at the time. And I think, you know, I'm not be, I don't want to be all like arty farty about it, but as an artist, you have to go where you feel it should go next and i don't want to make the same i don't want to make the same album over and over and over and over again i want to try and explore other areas and i want to try and be i, I want to try and be diverse but still keep i don't know I, I think if you if the attitude is right because that you know call it funk punk was because it was funky but it was also rooted in punk rock attitude yeah. so yeah, I, yeah I, I, but i would but then i was happy to come back to the more grungy you know, alternative rock of Z Nation, where it was just like a punch in the face, really, you know. And, and, and I have to say, the first thing that hits you is the production is huge. Great production on that album. Drum sounds are amazing. Thank Shred you. Away. It's just, yeah. We work very hard. So I work out of a studio called Echo Studios. The, the, the engineer I used to a guy called uh, 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 Jamie Masters. And I sort of led him a dog's life, really, because I played him records that were a million dollar, you know, a million dollars spent on them. And we're in, you know, a 22 pound an hour studio in, in Buckingham. Make it uh, sound like that. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, and, he, and he's like, you know, but Steve, you know, that's a million dollar project. I mean, yeah, I know that. I know that. So we've just got to work as hard as we possibly can to get close to that, to get close to that. And even if we're capturing the power of that and make, you know, so we worked very hard to make sure that everything was in the right place that, you know, so we can compete with the big boys. I don't just want to be, I don't just want it to sound good. It sounds like just above demo level. I want it to be up there with the, the sonic quality of, you know, the Foo Fighters or ACDC or whoever you think has got a great, I wanted it to, I wanted people to say the production's great. I work very, very hard. So I really appreciate you saying that, mate, because that was something that we that we really worked very, very hard to to get to that yeah. point. And that that is, and I think that perhaps should should be one of the first things that hit you when you listen to an album. It sounds great, you know, regardless of how good or bad the songs are. You want to hear good production, you know. Yeah. And, and and thankfully the songs are great as well. The opening track, I just love it. Black Art of Love. Thank you, man. Just great, and it. Rem I don't know. There's so many influences in there. I hear a bit of the Stooges. I hear a bit of. Oh God, I, I don't know. There's so many, isn't there? You can go on and on. Yeah, well, the, the Stooges, sort of, especially the opening bit where it's sort of like the really low vocal, which a lot of people, I'd, I'd never sung like that before. I yeah. do it all the time when I'm at home, and I sort of mess about doing Iggy Pop sort of impersonations. <laughs> and then, and when I was writing Black Art of Love, I thought, you know, I could do it you know really low and, and so that's what that's what happened and the way we got that take the way we got that take was I, I planned to be in the studio at 10 I got straight up didn't drink anything didn't have a cup of tea or a glass of water went straight into the studio it was already set up for me and I just sat in the control room and had the microphone and did it like with that croaky early morning voice we all get you know yeah. or if you're jet lagged or if you're tired you get that low croaky voice so that's how we got the take you know it um, worked. <laughs> but yeah, so I was, but there's, you know, and, and you know, because my influence is, you know, I'm a 70s kid, so it's Clam Rock, it's Led Zeppelin, it's The Who, it's The Pistols, it's The Clash, yeah. it's The Stooges. Uh, um, Hearing all that. New York, New York Dolls. Oh, that's, you, that, that, New York Dolls, yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's that. That those are my kind of influences because I was because I think your influences come to you when you're in your sort of like uh, early teens to mid teens. The other things do influence you, but there you're so you're like a sponge at that point. That's when all those bands were coming out, when all those bands were happening. So you know that that was what I wanted to get, but always with an eye on the future, always with an eye on you know I do listen to modern rock. I do know what's going on. I do I, you know I don't go well if it's not. You know, if it's not anything after 1977 doesn't exist. I'm, I am up on the, the recording techniques and the sound of albums and the way that people produce. But with that 1970s attitude, I can't help that. That's where I come from, you know.
There's, there's no Tommy Dorsey in there, that's for sure. There's no Tommy <laughs> Dorsey in there, but there might be. I tell you, oh, someone else who's really influ- influenced me as like a, as a singer would be would be Bowie because yeah. one of the first albums I ever bought was A Lad Insane, right. and I'd never, you know, you've never, heard, you know, when you first hear David Bowie, you've never heard anything like it, and um, and that wine in his voice, that sort of London wine in his voice, was really. So sometimes I have to go back and go, no, it's, it sounds like you're trying to be David Bowie, mate. Let's, can we go back and redo that, you know? Um, but my, and my goal was to sing in a London or an English accent, at least. Yes. Because there's so many there's so many people who sing in American accents. It's <laughs> so, you know, you listen to Elton John, you think he comes from the South, South you know, deep South of America. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, the, the vocally, vocally very much John Lydon and David Bowie, I would say, and Iggy Pop. Them. Yeah, three of my favourite singers. Well, it, it's a great album, and one I think you'd be very proud of. It's um, and I'd love to hear some of that stuff live. So if you're around, hopefully I'll get to um to come and have a listen because it's the album is just chock full of great, great, you know, great numbers. So um, thank you, mate. Thank super, you, really appreciate it. Super faker, awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was just a. I sort of wrote that. As, I wrote that as jokes. It's sort of like it's quite. It's quite punk for mm. what we do. Mm. Um, and then I just thought it came out so well. I was like, no, it's going. It's, go, it's going on, and everybody in the band liked it. Everybody was like, oh, you got you know, because there was quite a few to choose from. Mm. Um, and and it was sort of open to uh, open to the forum of of the four guys who wants to do what, and that one was was a firm favourite. So. You know. Well, that's great stuff. And before before we finish, c- just talk talk us through Eighth Wonder, Steve, because that's a it's a weird, it's kind of a bit of a weird fit, isn't it, for you? That from from, from that's great, what, man. It's what what great, what we've been talking about? Yeah. So yeah, you're talking about all these you know punk rock names and rock names like Billy Duffy and you know John Deacon and all that stuff, and then like plopped in the middle of it is Eighth Wonder with Patsy Kensit, this fluffy poppy, you know. 80s band but the, what happened was was that in my early bands right the guy that I sort of grew up playing in bands with right like so my first band the gate crash and all that stuff that we tried and tried and tried and we just tried lots of different things and never worked and um, when I went off with Jake Burns and the, uh, Jake Burns and the Big Wheel um my mates started working with Ace Wonder and because they were from Hounslow and Patsy's brother Patsy Kensit's brother had gone to Jeff for guitar lessons and said, Jeff, would you come down to our rehearsals? Because my mate Jeff, who played guitar, was an absolute you know, genius. Yeah. And he sort of knocked them into shape musically. And they got this massive record deal through Steve Dagger, the manager who used to manage Spandau Ballet. And the fact that Patsy was already famous. Mm-hmm. So they had, they had Steve Dagger as a manager. They had, and they signed, to, they signed to CBS, which was Sony Records, mm-hmm. right? And then... I was doing Jake Burns and the Big Wheel. I, I was down on my luck, so I, we, we weren't making any money, so I had a day job. And one day I get a phone call out of the blue from my mate Jeff, who's in, who'd already been on the telly and was in this, you know, they were up and coming in the pop charts, Eighth Wonder. He said, listen, Steve, we're doing a TV show tomorrow. Can you do it? I said, yeah, of course. So I had a day off work and went and did this TV show. And Patsy Kensit went, oh, Steve, so rock and roll. We've got to have you in the band. And so Steve Dagger... The manager said to me, Steve, you've got a load of work coming up. How do you fancy being a like a session guy for Eighth Wonder? We've got a video when we're going to go to San Remo for the um, TV festival in Italy next in a few weeks' time next year. And and I was in. So I quit the day job. And and the thing is, is that I'd been in Jake Burns and the Big Wheel, and we really, you know, we'd done a lot of touring, we'd done a lot of re- recording, but it hadn't really ignited in the way that Jake and I would have liked. Sure. So I it was sort of all over by the shower with, with, with Jake Burns to Big Will. So I went off with Eighth Wonder and that was that. And um, and it was pop stardom. It was, you know, we, we did a track with Stock Aiken and Morton. You know, I programmed the drums though. So I went, yeah. no, 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 no. Come here. I'll, I'll show you. He did a track with the Pet Shop Boys, I'm Not Scared, which was huge. I mean, that got to number one in Italy, got to number one in France, mm. you know, and it was, it was, it was a big hit on, on, on the, on the domestic chart in France and the international chart because in France they have two types of, they have the domestic chart, which is all French speakers. Sure. But what Patsy did was on the B side of I'm Not Scared, she did it all in French. So oh, in wow. France, they used to play the B side, Je Papier, right? I'm Not Scared. So it, so we were like high in the chart on the domestic chart and the international chart in France. So I'd spend weeks and weeks in Paris on expense accounts. You know, it was 
it, it was brilliant. And I'd come from being in Jake Burns, the big wheel and hanging curtains for a living. So, so your, at your lifestyle at this point then, was it, was it quite different touring wise and things, uh, you know, rather than maybe going around in a van, were you now kind of flying and, and, you know, first class, what have you? Yeah, that was exactly it. It was a real shock to the system because suddenly I was on a plane every other day we were and so the band were massive we had seven number ones in italy so we were in italy all the time we even got a private jet there was this show called red ronnie and we were number one in italy and they wanted us to appear on red ronnie's show on the saturday night and we said, well, it's, and they ordered a private jet and we flew on, yeah i mean really it was just what the hell is going on and so my life completely changed i was earning a shitload of cash um and so i, I got a deal with Camera drums, got a deal with Zildjian cymbals. That I had drums coming out of my ass. You know, when I needed them, when I had no money, nothing. <laughs> I could nothing. And then I'm earning money and I could buy them. And they were giving me these drum kits and giving me snare drums. And set, I was in the studio and they sent like seven snare drums, brass snare drum, chrome snare drum, Stuart Coven snare drum, this one, that one. It was that, that, that was pretty incredible. And we did play live. We went to Japan, we toured Japan, played the Buddha Khan and stuff. Um, and we did when we toured Europe because the, the band was big in Germany and France and Spain and Italy. And um, so it wasn't just a studio band and it wasn't just the mime band. And Patsy wasn't the greatest singer in the world, but she was as good as Kylie Minogue. So yeah. say Patsy had decided that she wanted to continue her career. She could have been the British Kylie Minogue because the voices are very, very similar. Um, and Patsy could have done it. But Patsy got... Um, a, a role in uh, uh, it was uh, she started getting Hollywood was knocking on her door. They, they you know that, that Hollywood was calling, and um, she did. She was in Lethal Weapon too. Yeah. So why did she? And, and she just got caught up in the whole Hollywood thing. And good for her. That's great. But it meant the, the band would put on the band would put on you know, on, on ice. And so we we've been recording a second album with a guy called Steve Brown who produced the Love album for the Cult oh, and God. also. And also did the first Wham album, and we we done seven or eight tracks with him. But that album is yet to be, but will never be released. Never see the light of day. Um, but then Patsy went off to Hollywood, and I went off and joined this band called Horse, who was mm. like an art rock band from Scotland. And then I started working with Julian Lennon. So one thing went to another, went to another. You know, I... it's a hell of a story. It really is, isn't it? It's just I don't know, amazing, amazing. I... You know, it's a credit to you, it really is. And and things sometimes looks on your side a little bit, isn't it? You know, yeah. talent is there, there's no question. But when things roll into each other like that, it's meant to be. And people talk, don't they? Yeah. They, they do. Yeah. When you're out of work, you'd like to think these good players get the work and, and that's the way it should be. But you're, you're absolutely right. But what, one thing I would like to say to anybody who's listening is, it, it's, is there's loads of talented people out there, right? I know talented people who are painting walls and driving cars, and they are incredibly talented. And you do have to have a bit of luck. Hmm. You really have to have, or you have to be ready that if that luck comes along, you, you are fully prepared to make the most of the opportunity. Hmm. Um, so I think a lot of very famous and successful people think they're there. You know? because they're so much better than everybody else. And that's not true. Mm. They just got lucky and made the most of it. But some people don't even get the chance. So it's not all about how great you are. You have to be good. Of course you do. You've got to deliver. You have, yeah. to have, you have to have a bit of luck on your side. You have to talk to that guy who knows that bloke who says, I know, I've got, an, I've, I've got the job. Right, so this band, Paul's, that I got the job in, um, that was the accountant at Eighth Wonders Management Office who knew the bass player in Horse and said, oh, I know a drummer if you need one. It's the guy from Eighth Wonder. It's that disjointed and it's that arbitrary. And then, he, and then they phoned me up and I went down and I played and I was okay and I played the gig. And my first, I tell you what, my first show with this band Horse was a live television show in Germany. We'd had three afternoons rehearsal. It was a live television show in Germany. Then the next night was in Glasgow, where I was introduced as the drummer from London and the whole fucking audience booed me because I was English, right? And then the third night was at Wembley Arena in front of 12,000 people supporting Tina Turner. There was about three songs. I still couldn't remember how they finished. <laughs> 
oh. I don't know this one ends. And then it's just, and then talk, talk about that thing where you just, just play. I just played. And then I heard the first figure. Oh, yeah, I do know how it ends. You know, but oh. yeah. But that's how things roll. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And then the bass player from, from Horse started working with Julian Lennon. And Julian Lennon needed a drummer. So my mate in Julian Lennon's band said, Steve. And that's, that's how it works, you know. But you have to have that bit of luck, you know. And, and you know, a massive part of it is getting on with people, isn't it? It's quite simple. Oh. Turn up on time. Be nice. Just be not, if you act like a rock star, no one's really interested. You know, even if you are a rock star, no one's interested anymore. We're so far down the road with this rock and roll thing that people really don't put up with our souls, you know. So just be nice, do your job, be good at what you do and, and, and just rub along. Just, just rub along. And if, you, if, if you've got an ego on you, you know, we've all got an ego. I can be difficult when I'm tired and hungry. I know I can, you know, um, but I wouldn't take that out on anybody else i'm just a bit quiet and a little bit you know just but you like you said just rub along with people be nice yeah that's all that's all it takes you know well i think that's a good praise the to god do. of love praise the god <laughs> of luck every every now and then you know hope there's something good have the expectation that something good's gonna happen something good will happen it will happen it will happen you have to yeah, and you have to have faith in yourself and you have to keep oh mate, you have to keep believing. But you do have to kind of keep believing in yourself, you know. Well, I, I think that is the perfect place uh, on that on that great advice to wrap oh. it up. Steve, okay, mate. Um you've been a gentleman. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great talking with you. Mate, and you, mate. Yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's do it again soon. I, I you must come it. and see you must come and see stiff little fingers when we're playing around. You know, obviously come and see Z, because I think we're gonna be supporting Spear in December. Sure. Come and see RTZ, but um, uh, when SLF on tour in, in March, you know you I must come you. along. I'll, come I'll, along. I'll speak to Adam. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll sort it for me. He's a no, good... you can do it. For, do it through me. Just email cool. me, and I'll put you on the guest list, mate. Ever come back and meet the band and have a chat? Would, after, I would love to. That would be yeah. amazing. Look, when you're going to when you're going to ask me about what size sticks I use? Oh, we don't get into that. <laughs> I'll ask you if you want, <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> I use whatever's available around it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Those, those I'm only joking. Right. It's, the, it's the wooden ones. Yeah, wooden yeah, it's, ones. A, it's a classic question, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Two of them. <laughs> yeah, two of them and they're made of wood. You've been a gentleman, mate. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So, um, Thank yeah, good luck with the new album. Um, I know it was released yesterday. We'll say that. Yesterday. Confusion. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, take care, mate, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Matt. I really appreciate it. Thanks.